Hello everyone, it is Joe here from OmniPoke, the channel that brings you guys everything Pokemon. If you're looking for PTCG live codes, make sure you check out the Potown store. You can get a 5% discount on your orders using that code OmniPoke. For today's video, we're going to be talking about the Mask of Change set, which was released in Japan uh, overnight, and this is going to be part of our Twilight Masquerade set, alongside the cards that we've already seen from the Crimson Haze Japanese set. Uh, so this will be part of our... Uh, June expansion, which is going to be the NAIC, uh, so a really important one for a lot of players, as that might be the last chance saloon for a lot of people. Uh, we are on the PokemonProxies.com website. This is the one that Jack maintains and manages, and we already have great-looking proxies for you guys to download, but also we can talk about all the cards today. I've just zoomed down to the bottom. Some of these cards we already have seen and talked about a little bit, so I'll try and be a little bit more brief on those, uh, but there are some great new cards in here to talk about uh, so let's start with the Ogre's Mask. This is one we already had seen, because uh, we have this card actually in English already, uh, where it synergizes with those Ogre Pond EX. We've actually got no more synergy cards with the Ogre Pond deck. Uh, so the sort of idea around this is that the Grass Ogre Pond EX has great onboard inbuilt acceleration, but it can only go to itself. So then you can springboard off of that Grass type into these other attackers, which we'll look at in more detail later. Uh, but the long story short is the Water one is a potential bench damage threats, the fighting one is an annoying walling Pokemon, and the fire one, which has the most awkward attack cost of the lot, because uh, it's all fire-based for its high damage output option, but the deck does have potentially a high damage output option. The grass one can at the very least deal with a Charizard EX, so that's something to bear in mind. I don't think the Ogre Pony EX, based on the new stuff we've seen today, is going to be like mind-blowingly broken, uh, but it is probably going to be a high-tempo basic attacking deck, and we've seen over the last few formats that the likes of Maridon, the likes of Roaring Moon, the likes of Future hands. Um, they all have a standing and a showing in the format because they're going to be low to the ground consistent decks. This has inbuilt draw power. Uh, so I wouldn't be surprised if we saw a very item heavy Ogre Pond based deck that flicks around a couple of these. So the master's is going to be integral to that style of deck. Then we have the uh, Waking Whistle. It's an item card that looks at the top five cards of your opponent's deck, then put any number of basic Pokemon you find there onto your opponent's bench. Then your opponent shuffles the remaining cards back into their deck. This is quite an interesting one uh, where we are giving controlling players potential to force more Pokemon into play to then possibly trap with Counter Catcher and such like we've seen with Block and more while uh, trapping strategies. So it's kind of like a Misfortune Sisters uh, where you're having a random top five. So there's a chance to whiff. And actually, the chance to hit the things you want to trap is quite low because in general, they're only playing like one-offs of things that don't attack in their deck, like the tech Pokemon, like Manaphy, Jirachi and whatnot. So you would think the ratios aren't that high, but the fact is it's like a free hit, right? Unlike Misfortune Sisters where you're giving up potential of like setting up your board or having other means of disruption every turn, you can just draw into these whistles as you go. You have the potential to play four of them, obviously. And when you see it, you can just rip the whistle and maybe it works. And of course, because we have Silene, you can have a bunch of attempts for this. So uh, really interesting that this can be a new means of forcing Pokemon into play. I think we've established that the Mantine is really annoying to use because first, that you're giving your opponent free prizes back um, just by putting it into play and having to find energy for it as well and all of these resources that could be devoted to things like Radzard in the later game. So uh, this card could be not very space efficient in control but could give them that dynamic of trying to attack you in a sort of trapping sense as well. Uh, so I do think it's a potential powerful card uh, for that deck, especially because you have so much infiniteness with Silene that you can have a ton of attempts for this for it to eventually find your target, whilst like throughout the entire game, unlike using that Mantine turn, where you're basically giving the opponent free prizes and taking like a turn off your disruption, uh, you can keep your block lacks in the active, you can keep using more while, or you can be doing like Luxray Fang snipes, all that sort of stuff. So yeah, pretty interesting overall. We have the first new Ace spec, the Secret Box. I've kind of weighed this up a few times about how powerful I think it is, and it's certainly an interesting item card. You can only use this card if you discard three other cards from your hand, but then you get to search your deck for one item, one tool, one supporter, and one stadium card. Uh, so it's similar to like a Guz Haller effect, I suppose, where you're getting that smorgasbord and maybe you can build a deck around having these crucial elements within your deck to tutor when you need to. Now, the thing that's kind of weird about Secret Box is 
a lot of the time, our item search is going to already be in a supporter effect, like the Arvens or the Iridas. That's the main way that you could, like, tutor out secret box. So really, you're getting a supporter for next turn, similar to how, like, you would Cyrus for a Cyrus, if that makes sense, to guarantee that you have a next turn play. Uh, whilst also getting some more proactive cards, you get that sort of refund from an Arven or from uh, an Irida of getting a different item out of the deck. So you're getting the secret box to then go and grab the item you were initially intending to do, which is kind of interesting. We know tools are pretty powerful right now, and and uh, stadiums aren't uh, like maximum power, but most decks are playing like one or two. Maybe it gives you a bit more consistency for like poker stop or something like that, which is kind of interesting. Now, where this like becomes a much more niche card is that first of all, you're up against reset stamp, or sorry, unfair stamp, uh, which is even better than reset stamp, and uh, prime catcher, which is pretty stiff competition. That me makes me think that it's going to be quite niche, and I think that. Right now, off the top of my head, of like the decks in formats that might want to play this, maybe this is better than Drum of Awakening in Ancient Box, because it can give you access to uh, Booster Capsule, it can give you access to Sada uh, or Explorer, uh, and it can give you access to either Artisan or Pokestop. Uh, and then at the same time, it can get you uh, an item card refund. And additionally, it gives you uh, a discard three option, which can fuel your ancient discard pile quickly for the Vengeance Fletching, right? So I think it might be better than Drum for the existing decks in formats. I think it's probably not making it into a number of decks that we currently have. But there are a couple decks uh, potentially from this set where it could be the go-to A spec, which is kind of interesting. The main one I'm thinking of um, is the new like festival deck that I'll get onto in a moment that uses Thwacky and uh, Diplin uh, to deal some damage. Uh, and in that deck, the secret box is very, very powerful. The Thwacky can tutor this out for you into your hand, which then essentially burst into four different tutors from one Thwacky, which is absolutely insane, actually. Uh, and you have the high role of just like seeing this in your opening hand sometimes, and it's like at the very worst going to set you up for next turn whilst being a fifth um, buddy poffin. So it is powerful. It's just having to niche down into certain archetypes, I think, right now. And it's one of these awkward cards where it's so, so strong if you see it in those opening, like, 10 to 12, 15 cards or whatever from, like, your opening hand plus whatever Pokemon abilities or, like, draw supporters you can do to draw this. And then you find it and then it's busted. Um but there's going to be situations where it gets sort of like diminishing returns, especially if you build your deck in a way where you only have like one or two stadiums or one or two tools and you've already found them or whatever. So it's a hard car card to like time well in a number of decks, which makes me think it's a little bit niche compared to some of the busted A specs that are already uh, in format and coming out uh, within this set as well. But uh, certainly an intriguing one, and I love these deck building puzzles where you can construct your deck in a way where this card becomes like so insane. And I was a big believer and lover of Guzhala uh, throughout its tenure, so it's going to be a really interesting deck building decision whether or not you want to sculpt a list around this card. And you could end up doing that in a number of uh, decks. Another new A spec we have returning to the form actually is Scoop Up Cyclone. Simply puts one of your Pokemon and all cards attached in into your hand. Very, very powerful uh, item card. This saw a decent amount of play uh, when it was initially uh, released, but it was up against just some very high consistency A specs in the formats of Comp Search and Dowsing at the time. I feel like there's enough consistency in this format and enough opportunities to search out this card when it's going to be devastatingly powerful uh, that I think it could be very good uh, for possibly like controlling archetypes. We've seen that double Churro Yell Cheer is like good in Charizard, so maybe Scoop Up Cyclone becomes a possible A spec for Charizard to open up into. A lot of potential tanking archetypes out there. Uh, we're going to look at the new Blissey later, which could be falling into that category. Uh, having an item version of this card seems pretty powerful, especially because it's that classic of when Arvin's already very strong, when Irida's already strong in a number of archetypes, having the chance to find this at the right time is going to be very powerful. It still ticks that box of like helping you get out of traps, but can also be fixing your board of annoying Pokemon that have been sat in play, like your vulnerable two prizes, like Luminion and whatnot, so you could be fixing your board in that sense, or it could be a pseudo-healing card, right? So... Pretty versatile one, actually. Again, stiff competition of Prime Catcher, stiff competition of Unfair Stamp. So it may be like just below the bar enough to be uh, not the most common choice in a number of the lists, but it could still end up being a big consideration card. Bug Catching Net, I think, is really, really powerful. This is going to be integral to a Ogre Pond EX base deck because you have Grass Ogre Pond EX, which is going to be like the main 
one that you play, you probably play full four copies in the deck, and you play Grass Energy up the Wazoo because that's your draw power slash cycle option from the EX. But I also think this is really good for the uh, Diplin deck, so this is going to help you get your Grookies, Thwackies, uh, Aplins, and Diplins uh, so that you can establish a board and the deck needs to have a full bench to be able to do anything. Uh, and a Bug Catching Net plus Buddy Buddy Poppin actually gives you a good opportunity to go quite wide in the opening stages of the game, uh, which is going to be essential not only for your damage output, but your busted engine comes in the form of your Thwackies. And once you get one Thwacky, typically you're going to be able to springboard into a bunch of them and have a really powerful board state. So the Bug Catching Net is going to be uh, pretty important for that to get your basics developed pretty quickly. We have Handy Fan, which is a tool card saying that whenever the active Pokemon this card is attached to takes damage from an opponent's attack, move an energy from the attacking Pokemon to one of your opponent's benched Pokemon. So throwing in some extra energy disruption seems pretty okay. Uh, I don't think this is like an amazing card, but you can see that if there are going to be like one turn attachment style decks in the format, if you can disrupt that, similar to how we've seen like Bouflant be a tech card or even Clawth uh, EX be a tech card just to sit in the active and sponge and be a headache for these one attachment per turn decks, it could be a spanner in the works and could easily end up being a one of card. Uh, I think we've seen stuff like this in the past not be too powerful, so I, I'm not holding out a huge amount of hope, uh, but it's like a reasonable one of based on how much controlling stuff there is in the format right now and can put your opponent into weird positions, especially like in combination with crushing hammers coming into the mix as well and whatnot. Uh, we have the Kieran supporter. We have already seen this one, but it's a either switch effect or a Leon essentially where you're doing 30 more damage, uh, but it's only to EX or V Pokemon, but that's generally the tankiest stuff in the format. This seems like a really, really good card. Um, it's going to help us push a number of Pokemon into much better range, which is very powerful. Um, and I think it's good in Charizard at the very least and could be good for a number of other decks looking to hit crucial thresholds whilst also adding a non aerial switch out in your deck. <laughs> so yeah, pretty good card. I think it's often going to be like a one of at most, but it does seem versatile. Like right now, again, we're seeing two Churro plus Yelchir. That could easily become one Churro, one Kieran, uh, one Yelchir, and it could end up being like a mirror tech whilst also keeping the same amount of outs uh, for switching so that's pretty important carmine is a discard your entire hand draw five so not the strongest effect but you can do this on turn one so it does give you deep digs and can allow you to establish that board a little bit more give you that greater opportunity of finding some of your crucial item cards uh like buddy buddy poffin just to establish that board i haven't thought of many decks that i want to put this in just yet um uh, but i could easily foresee this being a supplementary supporter, things like we've seen research in the ancient boxes as of late, I feel like Carmine could easily be a similar effect in that deck, uh, but could be used on the turn one so that you can just establish your Pokemon more quickly, which is one of the like, weaknesses of the ancient box, that its sort of draw power starts out slow and some of their supporters are kind of locked behind, you know, needing to already have discarded energy and such. Uh, so just having a supplementary discard synergy supporter is like good for the format, I think. Uh, we have Hassle, you can only play this card if any of your Pokemon were knocked out during your opponent's last turn. You get to look at the top eight cards of your deck, then put three of them into your hand and shuffle the rest into your deck. Pretty uh, decent card, actually. You're getting to cherry pick three cards within eight. That's really good value compared to things of the past, uh, like Misty's Determination, which was like barely playable, I suppose. But even things like Bill's Analysis that saw play in certain eras... Uh, as like a supplementary supporter. I feel like Castle, because it has that drawback of only being useful when a Pokemon's been KO'd, it then limits it to mostly probably one prize based decks. Uh, but I do think this could be very versatile. Again, I'm thinking of the Thwacky deck where you pull out this one card and that gives you this much burst sort of value all in one hand. Think of it as like a busted chorus, whereas rather than seeing uh, five, you're seeing eight. Uh, and that seems really, really good. And obviously you're not losing those other crucial resources either. So... Again, this could be like a one or two of very good value, deep dig into the deck, which is cool. We have the Festival Grounds. This is a stadium card, which will be relevant for decks later. I know I've mentioned it a bunch. I don't think it's like a super top tier deck or anything like that. It just so happens that I've mentioned it a few times because it's on my mind. Uh, but the Festival Grounds is an integral four of stadium for a deck, possibly, even though it has very bad text in itself. It's an enabler for other abilities on Pokemon in this set. The effect of the stadium itself is that all Pokemon in play that have energy attached to them can't be affected by status conditions and you heal any that have any energy attached to them. It's a nice bonus, I suppose. The status conditions really aren't that powerful in the format right now, so it's not a big deal. Uh, but 
you can essentially wipe out all this text and give it like this enables Pokemon to attack twice. And if you think of a stadium having that text, it's very, very strong. Uh, so yeah, we then have Jamming Tower. This is this the strongest card that we see today. This might be the strongest card that we see actually. Maybe the Bug Catching Nets, uh, but I think Jamming Tower is a really, really strong card. There are some worlds where playing one Jamming Tower is the equivalent of using like two Lost Vacuums in one card because obviously a vacuum can either hit Stadium or Tool and Jamming Tower is always putting itself into play as a Stadium card, but is also targeting tools at the same time. So in some regards, it could be like double the disruption of one vacuum within one card slot, which seems really important. And tools are amazing right now. We have uh, two massive A specs with Hero's Cape and Maximum Belt. Uh, we have Emergency Board, which is annoying for um, the Confei engine, as well as we're going to look at Tatsugiri later on. So that could be disrupted. We've got uh, Ancient Boost Energy Capsule as well. There's a lot of reasons why uh, Jamming Tower is going to be really important to slow down like potential tanking archetypes, but even things like Gardevoir where its damage output comes from that form, uh, where now once again it's going to fit stadiums back into its deck like it used to in the old days to counteract uh, Path of the Peak. Now it has to counteract this potential Jamming Tower as well. Seems like a very, very powerful uh, stadium card. I think it's going to be nice defensively as well to keep certain Pokemon out of range. Uh, I could certainly see some V-Star decks wanting to have this for the likes of Charizard so they can't do the like Defiance Band their way to 300, then have 330 as their late game inevitability. Uh, so yeah, very, very uh, strong stadium card that I'm backing. Legacy Energy is another A spec card. I think the last one we're looking at today, also a very powerful effect. Uh, ignore the top text here because it actually provides a rainbow energy but only provides one type at a time you can see uh in the card itself it's showing that rainbow effect there but it also has this text that once per game if the pokemon this card is attached to is knocked out by damage from an opponent's pokemon uh, your opponent takes one fewer prize card so it's similar to life do that we had in the past which was a tool card um but as we've just seen that jamming tower is coming out it's kind of a benefit that it's now in an energy form i know there is also energy disruption in the format as well. <laughs> uh, so it's not like a flawless plan and it's only from damage as well. Uh, but of course we do have things like Jirachi that you can try and do to stop effects of attacks knocking things out and we're not too worried about status conditions like I said earlier. And reducing a prize that your opponent takes is obviously incredible for up trading in certain instances. I have already seen that things like Lugia are playing this in the uh, new format where you can have Iron Hands back into your deck and now Archeops can power up an Iron Hands entirely on its own without the need for basic energy because this is costing the lightning cost, which is massive. Could be very good for Radzard in that deck as well. And they just fit much nicer than they did in the past where you, you had to shoehorn in basic energy, which is incredible. Could also be very good, of course, for single prize decks <laughs> where you want to give up even less prizes to give yourself even more time to grow the game uh, much longer. And it could be really good for things like Ancient Box as well. I feel like they're probably going to need to play the consistency uh, aspects instead, but this has such big upside. There is also more text that says you can't use the effect more than once per game. So even if you could recycle the legacy energy, you can't get the reuse of this minus one prize, which I think is massively important actually, uh, so that we can't have some crazy like Roseanne's backup recycle loop kind of deck that we saw in the past with Life Do. So uh, yeah, that's pretty important text to be uh, added to that as well once it comes out properly in English. But let's jump to the top and let's talk about some new Pokemon. Uh, some really interesting new grass stuff. They really s have thrown everything at Charizard at this point. We have a stage one Sunflora, which does Sunshine Return for one grass 60 times. The amount of fire energy attached to all of your opponent's Pokemon, pretty obviously trying to counter Charizard. That's what it's attempting to do. Obviously the Charizard players can choose to only get two fire energy into play and just attack with one Zard at a time and still the Sunflora isn't doing the job, which makes me think this is absolutely terrible. Uh, the Illamise is kind of interesting. You could easily be baited into thinking this is absolutely busted. Uh, you can only use this if you go second and on your first turn. You can shuffle one of your opponent's bench Pokemon and all cards attached back into their deck. Certainly is a disruptive attack. It is committing an attachment. Again, you have to get it into the active position. So it is going to require a big combo to make it happen. But on a lot of board states where the opponent has only got one of their like attacker lined up, say an Arceus is on the bench and they've been attached and you can just put that back into their deck that's really, really powerful. For lower hit point stuff, you could imagine that if you already could piece together like a big combo, 
what's stopping you from just having like a gust effect with maybe even iron bundle and then just like a low damage output attack that can just do like one for 70 or something. There's a ton of options for that in the format and it's not doing too much, but uh, it could take a prize as well. So I think it's not busted, but it is a really good like tempo block option, which is kind of interesting. I have to play around with this a little bit more because it's really interesting to access key one of Pokemon, which in many instances, especially if the opponent's gone first, uh, they can't really go completely wide and get those five bench Pokemon unless they've absolutely popped off on you. So the fact that you could just pop their one of Charmander or their one of Pidgeot back into their deck whilst you're putting other bench Pokemon onto your own side of the field so you can get sort of tempo back on them could be pretty interesting, to be honest with you. Uh, I'm not sure if it's ever going to be worth the deck space or if there's going to be decks that are naturally playing all these switching cards, all this other stuff, or just natural like free retreat pivots in their deck uh, to make it happen. But it is a powerful uh, attack effect, which made me think twice about it. Um, here is the Thwacky, which is a really, really powerful stage one, I think. Uh, the Bang Bang Drum is the ability once during a turn. If your active Pokemon has the Festival Lead ability, you may search your deck for a card and put it into your hand. And this is a stackable ability, so if you have multiple Thwackies, you can bang that drum three or four times, ideally, <laughs> uh, per turn. As long as you have one of those Festival Lead abilities in the active position, and typically that's going to make this deck be a Thwacky plus Diplin deck, which we'll look at in a moment. Uh, so having essentially a Stage 1, one prize Pidgeot that you can spam more than once per turn is crazy especially because you can use this Thwacky to get more Thwacky, and then your board is like fully developed just off one guy. Similar to how things like Grottle would get its next Grottle and you would do the same spam, and then your board is just like robust from then on. I think this is potentially uh, very, very powerful. It has synergy, like I said, with the new Ace spec. It also has synergy with that Hassle uh, supporter that I'm trying to grab to here. Both of these cards could be massive. Like If your first Thwacky gets Secret Box, then you just burst these four cards into your hand. Obviously, you need the Stadium in play to do the double attack anyway so uh, yeah that could be uh, a massive card uh, for the thwack also interestingly from uh, the other japanese set the hyper aroma could finally have a home where you use your first thwacky to grab hyper aroma and then you aroma into like more thwackies and then just pop off from there which could be kind of wacky um, but you need to have a festival lead Pokemon into the active there are a couple basics in here but diplin is probably the most impressive one in terms of an attacking sense, it's, it's a stage one with 80 hit points. It has its ability Festival Lead, which means um, if you have that Festival Ground Stadium in play, you can attack twice. And if you knock something out with the first attack, your opponent then has to promote a new Pokemon. Uh, and Do the Wave is just a 20 times the amount of your bench Pokemon for one Grass Energy. So you're effectively doing 200 a turn. That would be 400 into Charizard because you're a grass Pokemon. It's pretty cool that you have the option of like Vitality Band here as well, so you can 220 stuff. With such a robust draw engine of Thwacky behind you, I do think this deck actually has decent potential, to be honest with you. With the bug catching net, I'm pretty optimistic that you can tutor out your bench pretty quickly and get rolling fairly consistently. So I'm excited to test out that. You can also sort of steal space with bug catching net helping you tutor out grass energy that you don't need to play many in your deck. And you can just have that sort of reload option with rods or with the new supporter that can get non rule box Pokemon back, like the new Clara, whatever this card is, Lana's assistance. So yeah, I think I'm low key optimistic that there could be a new one prize beat stick attacking deck. The grass typing is really relevant, so you can be good into like ancient box. Your damage output is pretty okay into. Lost Zone variants as well, especially if you're already looking to play Vitality Band, so you can uh, hit EX Pokemon a little bit easier, or deal with uh, Cram, obviously, so that's pretty cool. And again, it's another check, potentially, to Charizard, and what's important about these one-prize checks is that typically Charizard is trying to get back into the game with, like, Hand Disruption plus Radzard, uh, possibly, like, Swinging with Pidgeot is their way back into the game in this matchup, for example, where you're not doing enough into a Pidgeot, they can pick it back up and do stuff, so they're still going to have lines of play into this deck, but you're definitely making them play an untraditional game plan and if you've gone first into them and can already just do the wave twice into like two basic evolving pokemon that's already like insane tempo on them uh, that they're not going to be able to have great comeback mechanics into so that's pretty massive and i think the best uh like counter that we actually have to the charizard out there there is a sinister as well i think we've already seen this one it does match it all out so this can also deal with charizard but you need to have lots of ogre pony x probably on your bench uh, which are just vulnerable two prizes that they can bung into so i don't think this one is all that powerful uh, to be honest with you uh, we've already talked about the ogre ponds a bit but this is the energy accelerating one that can also hit charizard for weakness and like i said it's going to be the springboard for the o other ogre ponds 
so that's kind of interesting. Could be in its own right, similar to how we saw uh, Galarian Moltres V just be like a consistency Pokemon that can burst energy into play and then you just play E-switches uh, for like colorless attacking decks or predominantly colorless attacking decks, I suppose, where if you can justify playing like Grass Energy E-switch as a combo, you can just have this Ogre Pond being a guy that accelerates throughout the entire game while cycling one to draw. Uh, that could just be reasonable. This could just be the new, you know, Galarian Molt essentially as an enabler for sort of higher damage outs sorry, higher energy costing uh, decks in general. Chandelure is interesting. It makes both players draw a card, but it's a stage two, so it's never really going to work out. The attack is trying to synergize here, uh, but if we've seen anything from like the hand clippers being basically not that powerful, even though the effect looks powerful on paper, the opponent can definitely lower their hand size when they need to and make this a pretty useless attack. The Fire Ogre Pond, I think it's pretty likely that it makes it into an Arceus Armor Rouge, maybe an outside chance it makes it into a Charizard deck just to have this burst of 280 uh, onto the board. Certainly a powerful effect, so one to keep in mind for that regard. I don't necessarily think it makes it into the all Ogre Pond deck though, because its attack cost being triple fire is just too awkward when grass is your main acceleration option. We have a Goldeen that does have the Festival Lead ability, so this may end up being your pivot in the deck. Uh, just by putting a rescue board onto this and just having it thrown into the active position means that your Thwackies are still online between turns when your Diplin is getting KO'd, because otherwise the opponent can go for a hand disruption, KO your active, and if you don't have a backup Diplin already in play, uh, obviously your Thwackies all go down, so... Just by having this ability on a basic uh, opens up lines for the deck, which is kind of interesting. It does have an option to flip coins and discard energy, uh, but it's not that big of a deal as an attacking threat. I would just look at it as like a potential pivot for the uh, Thwackies to stay online all game. Milotic has an interesting ability. Your opponent's Pokemon in play and the cards attached to those Pokemon can't be returned to their hands. So trying to put a stop to the Penny Loops, the uh, Churro Spam, the uh, possible new A-Spec, the Scoop Up Cyclone as well. Could be an interesting tech card uh, as like a 1-1 one -one line. There's also another Milotic in format that is forcing a Pokemon onto your opponent's bench as well. Similar, It's like an Echoing Horn effect in a stage one. So with that versatility of having like a 1-1-1 one -one -one, line of your Milotic, well one Feebas and two different Milotics, right? Maybe you do just enough as that package of like disrupting certain matchups, which could be pretty interesting to explore. Uh, so it's a cool card to have in the format. We have a Frostlass between uh, turns, put one damage counter on each Pokemon in play with an ability except Frostlass. Damage modification can be a little bit dangerous, but I do think this is probably gonna be too slow to be worthwhile unless like one counter is gonna make a huge difference and this is better than playing like a tool buff for certain decks or if you need to have a tool plus this to put yourself into better maths. But I think in general, it's a bit much work, even though the ability isn't necessarily weak. We have uh, Palafin and Palafin EX. So the Zero to Hero ability says that when this Pokemon moves from the active to your bench, you can search your deck for an EX and swap it with this Palafin, and then you shuffle this Palafin that you're looking at right now into the deck. And then we have the EX, which is a 340 hit point stage one Pokemon, insanely bulky, that has the ability, which means it can only come in through uh, this one's ability. So you can only get Palafin EX out via this Palafin. Uh, so you're probably playing a deck of like four Finizen, no, what's it? Yeah, four Finizen, four Palafin, and four Palafin EX. So it's like playing a stage two, but it's higher tempo. Like the stage two element is that you're having to commit 12 deck spaces <laughs> to this combination, or at least play like three of the non-EX and three of the EX, because you want to have enough in deck that if you draw them, you're not going to scupper yourself, right? Um, so it takes up a lot of deck space, but you have the tempo of being able to Giga Impact on turn two, which is the only attack of this card for one water. It's just a 250 swing, and next turn this Pokemon can't attack. You're already having to jump in and out of the active position anyway, so you're probably filling your deck with a ton of switching cards regardless, so I don't think that's a big deal. 250, as we've seen, is a really good number. Radzard is the number that we're looking at all the time for being a huge game-changing option. Obviously, that's on a one-prize Pokemon, so it's slightly different, but even Blood Moon, Ursa Luna that we'll be getting in this set as well is doing absolute bits in Japan right now. It's in so many decks as a tech card and it is massive. Uh, so having this option is huge. 250 as that threshold, having you push to 280 with Choice Belt or Defiance Band is massive as well. So yeah, this is really appealing to work towards. I'm not sure the best like thing you're going to be discoing around with, whether it's going to be Valiant to improve your damage output throughout the game, whether it's going to be uh, like Tatsugiri's or uh, Confes or whatever for extra consistency and dig. Um, 
I'm not sure where else things line up because this is quite a vanilla, like you're just hitting this number time and time again. It's going to require a lot of deck space because you also need to fill a ton of switching cards into your deck. And it does have that lightning weakness, which is still going to be a concern with hands around and with iron thorns around as well, potentially. So even though this is like very overstated as a Pokemon, you're having to commit a lot of deck space to try and make that happen. Uh, so I'm going to hold hold off on it for now. I don't think it's that broken, even though the vanilla stats look so silly. Um, the power level of other decks in the format make me think it's not going to be like game-breaking or anything. The Wellspring Ogapon does 100 to the active, and then you shuffle three energy from this Pokemon into your deck, then deal 120 to one of your opponent's bench. This can be done on turn one going second, actually. If you have enough Grass Ogapon doing their thing, and then you either E-switch a couple times to this guy and then get a Water Attachment for turn, or if you're um, doing Ogapon EX, like one E-switch plus a Mask of swapping a Grass one into a Water one, then still attaching that Water for turn, uh, means you could do this in a turn. And it's not a big combo, actually, because you're drawing so much with your EXs. That deck is definitely going to be playing, like, Pokestop, heavy item cards, like probably trekking shoes and the lot, you know, and it's going to max out on E-Switch, I would imagine. So it's a very real possibility that you get a torrential pump off on turn one, which could really punish any slow starts from the opponent. So Ogapon going second kind of reminds me of like pre-rotation Roaring Moon, where was that potential of a turn one Greninja play? Uh, but I think this will be higher odds than that deck as well, where you had to like start a double E switch attach. I think because you get to play research in this deck, as well as all your other like drawing item cards, this should be pretty consistent at getting that off and that's gonna be pretty dangerous for a number of decks that don't get that turn one manaphy developed so yeah i think the ogapon deck has big cheese potential of just being a high pressure early game disruption option uh, which is pretty wild actually we have luxray ex a pretty interesting stage two 310 hit points with the piercing glint attack for two colorless you deal 120 you look at your opponent's hand and discard one card you find there I think this synergizes pretty nicely with like a Pidgeot control deck. Obviously, we've seen Luxray V do similar things, and now we have a much bulkier body uh, that synergizes nicely. It's not necessarily easy to like heal and reload this card, but that's not really stopped Pidgeot sometimes getting into the action as an attacking threat. And it just makes your hand disruption that little bit stronger. It makes your trapping plays a little bit stronger. If you can get a few turns of doing this over and over again, uh, you can be knocking out like draw engine Pokemon whilst disrupting their hand and putting them into Brick City. So yeah, I think this is a really dangerous card actually. It is going to take up a lot of space to make it happen, uh, but I think it could easily be worth building around to be honest with you. Clefable can copy one of your opponent's attacks and use it as its own for just two colorless. Pretty efficient on a stage one, but it is again like a lot of work to make happen. The Fighting Ogapon EX has that really frustrating ability, preventing your damage from attacks done to this Pokemon by your opponent's Pokemon that have an ability. So it's similar to a low and Volpix V-Star, but it's on a basic and it's inbuilt with an ability, not just from an attack. So the opponent can't just like do the gust trick to get around you. They have to do other shenanigans to get around this annoying ability. It has the Demolish attack for fighting into Colorless, which is nice, has good synergy with the Ogapon deck that wants to have lots of grass energy within it. Uh, so you need to play a few fighting energy to enable this as an attacking threat. Uh, you deal 140. It's not affected by weakness or resistance or by any effects on your opponent's active Pokemon. It's a shame that it's not hitting for weakness because there are a couple of vulnerable Pokemon that are weak to fighting. So you're going to be a lot more niche. Going to be annoying for like Chempow. Going to be annoying for Charizard, although you already have the grass stuff for Charizard. So again, I don't think it's going to be like blowing me away, but it's frustrating for a few archetypes in the format um, that could keep them in check and make them commit deck space to like dealing with this guy because even if you only play one fighting Ogapon in the deck, because there is the mask, you could keep reloading and going back into it and run the opponent out of their like answer Pokemon and then just be the last man standing kind of thing. We have a Dragapult EX line. One of the best things about it is the Drac Cloak, which has the Telling Spirit ability allowing you to look at the top two cards of your deck, then put one of them into hand, the other to the bottom. It's literally airmail from Pidgeotto that we've had in the past. Very playable card and was the build around of some archetypes. It's cool to see that we have a playable stage one that could maybe enable the stage two Pokemon. It's a dragon type, so no weakness, no resistance, and one retreat cost. 320 hit points with a jet headbutt for one colorless, just a 70. Maybe it's good enough to clear away some 
basic Pokemon that want to evolve, and then the Phantom Dive is kind of the biggest attack here for one Fire, one Psychic. You deal 200, and then you put six counters on your opponent's bench Pokemon in any way that you like. We obviously still have Jirachi in format, and I think that's going to be in the majority of evolving decks just because Sableye still exists. So I don't think it's going to be backbreaking for a number of archetypes, but there are still going to be decks like Chempow, like Giratina, that may not play that Jirachi. And in those cases, you can obviously punish them. And in certain situations, you can take out that Jirachi, put pressure on them to continually like find their rods and reload and whatnot, which can be somewhat of a disruption option. The damage output isn't all that great, and the attack cost is a bit awkward. You probably need to have some acceleration. Could be from the form of the Mela supporter, could be from the form of Zatu, which could be an additional like stage one draw option uh, within the deck, so you can draw a whole heap of cards. I'm tentative in thinking that this one's not going to be fantastic, because I would imagine all the evolving decks will have protection uh, to damage counter placement. So I think this is going to be like low tempo and not be all that fantastic. But as long as there's not Jirachi, or if there are more answers to Jirachi, or even if you are just playing like the classic Lost City, I'll deal with Jirachi and then eventually get value from this attack. Um, maybe it's going to be a little bit more powerful. Yeah, I think maybe Lost City changes that fortune, to be honest with you. You can turn two Jet Headbutter and Lost City it, and maybe you're all good. Yeah, maybe it's a bit better than I gave it credit for. Just because Draclo draws a bunch of cards and you could easily just play an Arvin package, get multiple Draclo online, maybe like Zatu as a backup engine as well, just for that little bit of acceleration that's required here and there. Uh, maybe it works out. Kind of cool. I think you should never really write it off because it has great draw power behind it. I think, yeah, just figuring out how annoying uh, this Jirachi is going to be for your like tempo is going to be the big question mark. Um, but it certainly has potential, and as we know, like placing counters can open up the door for Devo plays and all this other shenanigans afoot, not just like taking KOs. Um, it can allow you to play around Iono a little bit better as well by setting up like a three prize end game or something. So, kind of interesting card for sure. We have Tatsugiri. It's a basic 70 hit point dragon Pokemon with attract customers. Once during a turn, if this Pokemon is in the active spot, you can look at the top six cards of your deck, reveal a supporter you find there, and put it into your hand, then shuffle the other cards back into your deck. So it's similar to that Celebrations Mew that we saw last format that's just rotated, uh, but it's for supporter cards. And as we know, supporters are very, very strong things to find, especially towards the later stages when your opponent is trying to hand disrupt you out of key win conditions like boss's orders or like finding Iona on your own end so you can disrupt the opponent back and buy more time. Uh, what's cool about the Tatsugiri compared to something like Poker Gear is that this can be sat on board, obviously, with just that one retreat cost. You can have that um, emergency board on it so you can just pivot in and out of the cards. I could easily foresee the seeing play in Zard and other like setup based decks that already plays Buddy Buddy Poffin, so you can retreat into this early, then give yourself that option to find Arvin and other key supporter cards in the opening stages just to boost your consistency. Uh, and the great thing is it doesn't have that same diminishing returns because then you can use this as a pivot in the late stages of the game to then get you out of jail from Iono. Very powerful, poffinable option. It's a high roll if you start it in the opening stages just to get into the game. Yeah, boost of consistency, very, very good card. And I'm happy to see it because it's on a very cute Tatsu which is awesome. We have Blissey EX, which I have seen a lot of opinions of. Certainly an interesting stage one Pokemon. 300 hit point, colorless type, weak to fighting, has the happy switch ability. Once during your turn, you may move a basic energy from one of your Pokemon to another of your Pokemon. Again, this is obviously stackable, so if you have a couple Blissey in play, you can be really moving stuff all around the board, which is very dangerous, actually. It means you can burst attackers into play, and it means that if we are playing the Sharon's Cares uh, or the Scoop Up Cyclone or whatnot, you can move energy off your Blissey, then pick it up to heal it, and then get your manual attachment in again somewhere else and uh, continue to chain attacks, which is what I think a number of people will look towards because it has such a high threshold of hit points on a stage one Pokemon. The attack is return for three colorless energy, which again leads into this like happy switch combination where you can have some sneaky attackers in here. You deal 180 and draw until you have six cards in hand. So you're constantly putting your opponent in a situation where they want to Iona you probably, especially as the game progresses. And it means you have a bit more license to play these greedy supporters like Sharon's Care, like Boss's Orders and whatnot. No Knowing that you can just top up on hand cards throughout the game, so you don't need much of an engine to sort of support the Blissey, which is really important. We also have the Lucky Bonus Chansey from the 151 set. 
Uh, if you took this Pokemon as a face down prize during your turn and your bench isn't full, before you put it into your hand, you can put it directly onto your bench and then you flip a coin. If heads, you can take one more prize card. Every now and then, this certainly might come up and give you a huge win condition just immediately. A massive swing card where you're naturally playing for Chansey in the deck. There's no reason to not uh, have this bonus high roll option that you could be working towards. We do have the Arc Phone, which can look at the top card of your deck, then you can switch it with one of your face down prize cards. So you could try and maybe manipulate a Chansey into your prizes to at least give yourself that 50-50, which is kind of interesting. There is still a lot of like one hero decks in formats, so you're probably gonna have to play like the Mist Energy, maybe some hit point buff tools, but I just like the versatility of being an all colors attacking deck, so you can splash lots of different Pokemon into the deck and justify that choice. Like you could play a Fighting Ogapon, you could play Radiant Greninja as a sniping threat in the deck where you can just happy switch all to it in one turn and then get a manual attachment and suddenly you're swinging. You could play Radzard instead and have a different single prize attacking threat. You could even play Iron Hands if you really wanted to, if you built this Omega board and having lots of happy switches going to it all in one go. Could be a pretty crazy deck, honestly, and I'm sure we could have some quite simplistic just consistent Blissey builds that are just on like high Sharon's care count and try and loop return every single turn of the game. But there could also be these really wacky toolbox builds, which has a much more wild energy cost uh, within the deck and tries to pounce with different tech Pokemon, which I think could also be really cool and almost like a counter style toolbox. And then we end on Ambipom. When you evolve into it, you can flip two coins for each heads, choose a random card from your opponent's hand and they reveal that card and shuffle it back into their deck. So again, more of the sort of hand trapping stuff. It's on coin flips, which is a little bit risky and it's random cards. But when we get to a critical mass of like having Airy, having Fang Snipe, having this Ambipom, your opponent could start getting hit from like fairly large hand sizes and eventually go down to zero. And especially with some higher damage output uh, plays from this Luxray where you actually can knock out engine Pokemon, um, yeah, I think hand trapping and hand locking could end up being a factor. So uh, maybe this is, even though it's like an RNG sort of bad line, because it gives you that critical mass of discards, you could put your opponent down to zero, which is something to keep an eye on, certainly. Uh, so yeah, overall, really, really powerful cards that we saw uh, from this set, sort of, sort of combining it with the cards we already saw. Uh, from the Twilight Masquerade, oh, sorry, the Crimson Haze stuff. Uh, so we already had seen Iron Thorns EX, which has already done well in Champions League as well. I need to do a report sort of on those decks um, now that they're out. Uh, Greninja is a really interesting card. It hits for Fighting Weakness, which is relevant for Blissey uh, and Blood Moon Ursa Luna. So that's something to bear in mind. This card is doing really, really, really well in Japan. And it's uh, oftentimes showing up in at least Lost Box and Lugia and is being a massive card there. Unfair Stamp is also a massive card and it's seeing play in a number of decks. Some Charizards, some Gardevoirs, a few other things like that. Those are some of the big cards from that set. I think Lana's Assistance could be good for this uh, festival deck. Maybe I've bigged it up too much, but I think on paper it is a decent one prize deck. It kind of depends on how the format lines up uh, in terms of like how countered is Charizard, I suppose. The Ogobon deck I think is uh, has a lot of potential as well to be very, very strong. Although it's not a high damage output two prize deck, it's not really the same shell as like a Roaring Moon or a Maridon, which was very like all in on tempo. I think the only real tempo plays this deck has is is the uh, Wellspring, and that could be blocked by a Manaphy early on. Palafin, overstated cards. Don't know if it's going to be built very consistently, or like can be built very consistently with the amount of space you have to shoehorn in to make it work, uh, but certainly might have upsides. Luxray is a cool piece for the controlling deck, as is that like whistle thing. Um, and what else have we got? Yeah, this is an annoying Pokemon. Like, as a tech Pokemon, this card is also annoying. That's what you have to bear in mind, right? We've seen that Arc decks were willing to tech, like, a 1-1 one, one or 2-2 two, two line of Low and Vulpix. And that card is, like, so bad compared to this one, which is immediately, as it comes into play, protecting itself and a threat against a lot of matchups. Uh, so the justification of just playing one of these plus one fighting energy could be like this tech inclusion that can beat certain decks just outright, which is scary. Dragapult, maybe I was a bit soft on it. I'm, I'm warming up to it. I, I think it has potential to do well. I'm always skeptical of stage twos, don't forget. But uh, this could be joining the mix just because the engine is absolutely cracked and I'd love to see it. Tatsu seems absolutely broken. Definitely going to see a lot of play. Blissey, again, like it depends where this toolbox goes. I, I can foresee it being really wide reaching and trying to hit possibly multiple weaknesses and having different ways of up trading uh, with either some little chaps that you can just 
send in and punch with uh, or just have different type coverages or just have like an amalgamation of, of the most crazy attacks in format of like Radiant Greninja and Iron Hands and this sort of thing. So that could be cool. Yeah, a lot of really interesting stuff to be honest with you. Uh, some of the A specs all join in and have like their own place here and there, even though they may be a little bit niche compared to the ones we already have. Jamming Tower is absolutely cracked. Bug Catching Net is finally going to help the grass stuff out a little bit more. So, so many things uh, to be looking at. And uh, because this is the NAIC set, I'm going to be putting a lot of attention into it. I am attending the NAIC, uh, so it is going to be my sort of last hurrah before Worlds. Uh, so I'm going to be putting a lot of attention into the expansion. Um, yeah, even though this is already quite a new format that we're currently in in Standard, I've always got my eye on the future, and I'm going to be bringing you more content around this when we get it. So, hope you enjoyed today's video. Let me know what you guys thought. Make sure to check out Pokemon Proxies once again, and I'll see you tomorrow for another video. Cheers.